Hello, Gary. Hello, Guy. You, you've had a rather exciting week. I know I can't say what it is, but there's quite no, a good say, little a project. Very, 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 very exciting week, which hopefully might lead to something on here. We'll have to see. Yeah, it's a very, very exciting project that Guy is involved in, and I will... Oh, don't you, you're jinxing not, it now. Uh, okay, should we, do a, should we do another take of this with you saying it was a great... <laughs> but, <laughs> but unfortunately... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. anyway, we've got Kelly Jones on yeah, today. Yeah, Stereophonics. Oh, I can't yeah. do Welsh. Oh, we never asked about it, but I mean, uh, apparently there's a lovely thing. Apparently they're named the Stereophonics just because, what was it, his dad or his uncle had this lovely old Stereophonic sort of receipt. Is that, that's, that's, and it, it's just the word Stereophonics. That's a make, isn't it? Something, like something Stereophonic or something is a make and he saw it written on the back of the... The radio, yeah. and he thought that's a that's a good name, but and yeah, the lawsuit is still uh, yeah. ongoing for use of a registered trade. Massive albums from sort of the end of yeah. the nineties onwards. I mean, millions of records supported incredible artists. So he's a he's a solo artist in his own right. He's just made a uh, a really great album out there, which is him telling stories and doing acoustic versions, sort of of of, of, of some of his big songs. Plus, uh, Stereophonics got a new album, Ucha, coming out, and I'm sure we're going to hear. Lots of it, plus going back to the old valleys, I would have thought. Uh, this is the lovely, it's, it is it is a lovely kind of boys from the valleys made good. It's a lovely story. Let's get him on. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. This was great, guys. I, I, it's so great to talk to two guys that have done this. Well, it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. You know, what people forget about Bowie is that he was such a kind man. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. I know you're musicians, but you've been more professional than a lot of journalists. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To, to get good at something. Yeah. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Ah! Hi. Hello, mate. How are you? Good, good thanks. Very well, thank you. Guy here. Hi, nice to meet you. Are you all right? Yeah, good, thanks. How are you doing? Very good, thanks, yeah. Is that your home studio, Kelly? Uh, it's a little writing studio we've got in um, near Brook Green. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, we've had it for about 10 years. So we come here to just uh, piece together the bits that we do in other bigger studios and then come back here to kind of tart it up. Did you build the studio or is it one that was there already? No, it was already here. It's not. Is it uh, a basement? No, it's kind of like oh, a bit okay. of a card. No, just thinking the there was a publishing company that had a studio down there back in the... 90s. Yeah, no, we, we came here with our management office. They were looking for an office and I walked in here. And there was a guy at the back who already did a writing space and I said, well, I think you lot are going to have to find a new office and we can have this one. <laughs> so, What's that? Yeah, it's all right. It's it's, it's, a bit, it's got like about three or four rooms. Uh, it's got flats above it and stuff. We don't really go late in here, but it's great for doing overdubs and tweaking stuff before mix stage and things like that. You know, somewhere to come to work every day. When you day, say basically. we, you, you still very much think in, in band mode. Uh, well, this this kind of became the band kind of headquarters, I guess. But usually it's just me and Jim Lowe, the engineer. Richard will sometimes pop in and out. But generally, by the time I come to this place, it's it's after we've got together in a room with all the boys. We normally do that. We don't really book a studio for a week, get all the tracks out, and then come back here. Um, just get as much of it done live as we can, and then whatever needs doing after, really. Thanks for coming on. I know you, you're taking over from Johnny Walker, haven't you? Uh, doing one of his rock shows. Yeah, I did two shows, yeah. It was a good laugh, actually. Yeah, the producer asked me if I'd do one of the... Not the one you're doing, but the, the, yeah. his, his Sunday show. And I couldn't because I was, oh, meant, really? to be, well, cause I was meant to be going on the road with uh, with Guy and, and, and yeah. Nick Mason uh, in America. And, of course, now they've got Paul and I couldn't do it in the end. But Bob Harris is doing it. And who can want more than Bob Harris? Well, I know. I did a Sky Arts thing with Bob Harris once. I was talking about him this morning. He was brilliant. We did... Um, uh, was it a songwriter's special thing with him? He's lovely. I mean, he's interviewed everybody, right? So we had him on the show. Well, we, we had him on here. We ended up getting a big scoop in the, which went in the Times and the Guardian oh, really? and everything. Yeah, and he told us the story of how Nixon asked Elvis to spy on John Lennon. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> He told me a great story that he had three wives around for Christmas Day once at the same time. And uh, I said, how did that go? He said, well, I won't fucking do it again, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> but can you but can you go? I just go back to that Elvis spying on John Lennon story. Can you imagine yeah, John yeah. Lennon sitting in his house and he's just suddenly, 
Is that Elvis looking through the window? <laughs> <laughs> no, mate, I'm the window cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I, um, I really loved listening to uh, Don't Let the Devil Take Another Day, the, yeah. this, this tour album, live album that you did with, yeah. of you chatting. I couldn't find the film anywhere. Is the film out there still? Yeah, well, the film, what, what happened with the film was it, it, it came out, went in the cinemas, and then the, the pandemic thing closed all the cinemas. And then we were looking for a home to put it on a streaming service, and then that all got held back. So at the minute, it's just floating about. The fans all got to see it for a couple of weeks just before the cinema previews. Uh, but then it just got held back until we find a proper home for it, really. So at the minute, it isn't really out there. So it kind of came, and then it went away again. So it'll, it'll find its place. It's point. kind of Springsteen vibe in a way, isn't it? But from a Welsh yeah. point of view. Yeah, I mean, I always love people like Tom Waits. I always love that album, Night Talks at the Diner, where he's oh, just yeah, telling yeah. stories in between uh his stuff and i always remember seeing a rufus wainwright gig once in chicago where his songs were very very moody and, and beautiful but then in between he was very very funny and and kind of jovial about you know his, his real life and stuff really and i just happened to stumble in that gig by accident really one day and i just it, it always kind of stuck with me um because you know sometimes most people just take a sip of water in between songs and stuff and when we play in the arenas and the stadium shows it's harder to do that communication with people because you're doing all the big hitters and it's a big show it's big production all the rest of it but when you're in that environment with just one kind of violin player and we had a rotating band so we kept moving around the stage Gavin was playing the trumpet and the bass and piano and stuff and uh, we had a girl drummer, Sharice, who plays with Simple Minds. Oh, Sharice! I know. Yeah, I yeah. talk with Sharice. No, I play with her with Brian Ferry. There is yeah. a, there isn't yeah. an She's episode, fabulous. is there? There isn't an episode of this podcast <laughs> where guys are. Well, played I do actually with want to talk obscure... about a gig that Kelly and I both played back in about it was 1999, 2000, which is still the most absurdly rock and roll place I've ever been. So, which one was that? It was at the Cafe de Paris. Oh yeah, yeah, that gig was was yeah. It was it's, yeah. I just point it out where I, I was there playing with. Um, Jimmy Page, yeah. Joe Perry and Steve Tyler from Aerosmith. You did a train kept a rolling. Yes, right. The, the Robinson Brothers. <clears throat> um, yeah. It was it was just playing all these Led Zeppelin songs. It's nuts. And then were you with Billy Duffy or Billy Duffy was hanging out with you? Yeah. Well, the night before it was Wembley Stadium. We opened up for yeah. Aerosmith at Wembley That's Stadium. Right. It was fucking, it was weird for us because three years before we were playing covers by the Black Crows in a pub, covers by Aerosmith, covers by Lenny Kravitz. <laughs> we were on the same pillars on the night before. <laughs> and then I walked into Cafe de Paris and Billy Duffy was there and uh, we were playing uh, covers by the cult as well. So he told me where I'm to buy and then he came on and done Wildflower with us. Yeah. But you were obviously picked to support because if anyone in the other bands dropped dead, you could just take over their role because you well, know. Well, yeah, right? that too, yeah. <laughs> it was, it, it was a bit, it was 1999, so Performance and Cocktails was a big record, so they stuck us on there, I think. But yeah, we could have covered any of the set anyway. What was the song, who were you playing with, Guy? What, what, what I was, was playing the... with Jimmy, it was Jimmy Page who brought me. Yeah. And we right. did. But that, that's where I had the, the I, I had the most embarrassing thing of, we were playing Heartbreaker by Led Zeppelin, and everyone was on there. And Joe Perry came over to me and went, hey man, you really know how to play this shit. And when everyone, <laughs> anyone gets kind of rock and roll with me, I just immediately become John LeMessurier. I'm just like, <laughs> you're, you're thinking, what to, oh, oh yeah, I'm down with this shit, yeah, whatever. And, I, and to my eternal shout, I'll never forget, I fucking said to Joe Perry, thanks awfully. <laughs> <laughs> he has, he has no idea what that second word is. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you got a new album coming out. I had a look on uh, iTunes uh, at, at Ucha. Yeah. And uh, yeah. that's amazing what they do now, because they've obviously got this kind of Roy Lichtenstein kind of cover you've yeah. got going. Yeah, yeah. And all the animation is going on, on. on on. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we did a little video for a track called Hanging on Your Hinges, and uh, we, we used some of the imagery for that. Um, but yeah, it's cool. You can you open a track on Spotify now, and you get a little loop of it, and it looks great when you're playing the track and stuff, but... Yeah, Uchiha was just a word I used to write on the on the desk board. It's just a word of celebration. You know, it means have it wherever you want. I always think of Ray Winston saying it, or Paul Weller. You know, um, <laughs> say so, it. I can't. I'm, I'm, what about well, listen, Uchiha? I, I could, just, you know, I could right. do. I could do Ray Winston, Paul Weller any day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uchiha. So it's just one of those, and uh, you know, some album titles are very. Um, much more meaningful, etc. And if the if the album reflects that, but because this was an album that came after two years of being locked up in the house, uh, we kind of done a bunch of songs that were much more kind of celebratory. Found a lot of stuff on on hard drives we hadn't released. And how we long do they go back? 
How long did the tracks go no, back? No, some well, yeah, some of the hard drives. Yeah, so, some of the ones. Uh, I was looking for this one track that I had a, I had a CD of it and I could not find the, the, the drive of it. And, and there's a little boiler cover just there. And I opened that boiler cover and I said, where the fuck is this drive? And I looked at my feet like that and it was an old Vincent my old man bought me in an echo machine. He was on top of there. Yeah, and I plugged it in and the fucking song was on there. I couldn't believe it. So we reworked that and that, that was on the record. Similar about 10, 12 years. Wow. Right. Your dad um, bought you a Benson, sorry. It's my dad's. My old man was a singer. So no, I, to, I know that. Well, we so want to get to all around the clubs, it's, yeah. It's fantastic, yeah. So, it's but he gave me, he gave me his Benson. He, he used to use that to go around the clubs as his... Um, as his... a fortune now. They're yeah, because yeah. that that's what David Gilmore uses that, used that's, in the yeah, old days. That's yeah. the, that's every, all of Pink Floyd. Up I gave it to, uh, you know, Terry McBride, right? Um, uh, not Terry McBride, Terry Britton, sorry. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Terry Britton Studio State of the Ark. Well, when I was recording that, I gave it to Terry and his son Dan to get fixed up for me, and they and they did a proper free fib job on it. So, yes. Yeah, it's, it's can, can I ask, is your, is your dad still around? Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'll, 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 to... we'll get to that. I mean, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the thing is about the, the two new tracks that I've heard off of Ucha is, and Ucha kind of makes sense, really, is because, because the album before that, the Stereophonics album before that, was a yeah. lot cooler. It was a lot, you know, had more acoustic. There was a sense of yeah, kind of. I don't want to say country, because but maybe yeah, I, maybe no, I it was. It did have that element, yeah. Where this one, from what I've heard on these two tracks, is is much more back to sort of ground zero guitar playing. Yeah, uh, kind of was a much more introspective record. A uh, lot of stuff to be said on that record, and it's a it's a much more kind of soulful, kind of heart in your sleeve type of album, you know. Um, and it has got country elements on it, Americana elements. Um, I called George Vercoolius into. To help me out oh, with that because we cut most of that live really and i wanted george to just listen for me in the in the control room and, and then we'd go in and piece it together but this record is much Who's more george uh, i've got it sorry you need to george, george, george Cooleus. he did like uh did tom petty he was ah, he right, worked yeah. wildflowers with rick rubin uh, and stuff of course, of course. the black crow stuff yeah so he's a good character so he can have you played with him guy uh no i've met him <laughs> <laughs> because you're used to you, you know, because you came up as a three-piece and everything, you you developed this fantastic style of, of kind of filling up all the space with your guitar without being sort of overly showy, which was, mm. must be a fantastically satisfying thing to play. Yeah, well, we were into, you know, when we started off, you know, the way Stuart would uh, hit the kick drum and, and his ride simply, and, you know, you'd, his, his thigh was as big as Kate Moss's waist, you know. So he, he could really... Uh, what, could, tiny? Yeah, 28 <laughs> inches. <laughs> um and uh, and the way Richard he played the bass, he kind of hit all the strings at the same time. So he was very, I guess, influenced by you know the early jam stuff and um, oh, okay. and uh, you know the Clash and, and Nirvana and stuff like that. So we would we would fill the space with the three of us. And, and the way I sang on the first three records, he was playing an SG. The voice was very much in the same register as an SG. Really, it was all very kind of aggressive in that bandwidth and it, and it filled the space, you know, so it didn't really need many overdubs or anything like that. It's all about the songwriting, really, and delivering in a way where people wouldn't turn their backs on us. Really. There's, a, there's a history of uh, of those kind of bands. Obviously, there was Jimi Hendrix as a three-piece, yeah. Groundhogs, yeah. Bud, Cream, Bud, Cream, Cream that, yeah. Budgie, um, Budgie, yeah. Budgie were a three-piece, weren't they? There was another Welsh band. Budgie were a three-piece, yeah. Welsh, course, yeah. Uh, Ray Sab uh, just lost him. Rory yeah. Gallagher. So they, yeah. yeah. We always used to cover a lot of that stuff, and it, it's an... It, it's a people take it for granted a bit, really, how much a three piece are pushing out there, you know. And uh, when you play in the pubs and the clubs and all that, when you start out, you know, the songwriting has to be key and people have to listen to the song. But the way you deliver it, it has to come in with a force. And it was a big wall of noise with us. Um, and then it became a bit more intricate as we went along adding all of But for two albums, we never. We wouldn't even put a fucking tambourine on a record because we're like, well, who's going to play that live? You know, we have to always replicate it live, you know. Girlfriends, girlfriends, that's what. They're... Yeah, well, they were at the bar, they were, they were buying the drinks. But there's got to be great, you've got to have a great level of confidence to carry the guitar and the vocal. Forget the songwriting, that's obviously done beforehand, but to, mm. to do it all and be that only guy, is it was that something that. Were you itching? Because I know eventually you've, you've had other guitar players come up and play with you. Yeah. Did you feel you couldn't express yourself one way or the other at times? You know. Uh, well, I was. I did my first gig when I was about twelve, and I was in a band, and, and the three of us were singing in that band. You know, we were doing different covers and writing our own stuff. But this is when you had to literally leave as soon as you'd finished the gig, right? Because yeah, just... yeah, we used to wheel our gear up the street on a little trolley. Yeah. But because my old man was a singer, I was kind of pushed into becoming the singer in most bands. But there was a point I, when I was younger, I just wanted to play the guitar, really. 
uh, you know, I wanted to be Angus Young or, you know, just play ACDC songs. But and then when I got to about 18, I, I kind of found the voice that I guess people are familiar with on the first record. But it, yeah. was, it, was, a, it was a bit of a process to, to finally let go and actually let it all out, really. So I guess for a while it was a bit of a, uh, a civil war inside whether I want to do this or that. But, you know, once I found it and then the lyric writing started to come because other kids were writing the lyrics in the band. I think once I started writing the lyrics and putting the voice together, it, it felt more comfortable doing the whole thing together, the three the three pieces. Of we'll, 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 we'll get to those lyrics because, you know, there's some nice stories about you growing up as a kid and yeah. writing those lyrics. But let's just try and think about what your house was like because you come from a... Um, Kumaman, am I right? Yeah, is where yep. where you grew up yep. near Cardiff, right? So, yeah, I'm so in... glad you got to say it first. <clears throat> I... Well, I got Welsh cousins. I used to go to Swansea every single summer. So far, I was oh, yeah? at Hollyhead. Oh, cool, chef. <laughs> Hollyhead's posh, mate, compared to uh, Swansea. <laughs> <laughs> is it? <laughs> um, and I, I I used to eat seaweed, lava bread in those days. Yeah, uh, did you? Yeah, when we back, <laughs> came up at weekends. Um, <laughs> But, you know, this is a poor town, isn't it? This is a, it's a mining village. Yeah. Kumaman was, um, it was a miner's village. Uh, it's lit- it literally is one road in, one road out. You get to the end of the street and there's a little youth club where we used to rehearse a bus terminus and then you turn back around because there's a mountain there. You can't go any further. So there's not many kind of cul-de-sac villages that even exist like that. There's literally nowhere else to go. So growing up, there was a mountain. There was four mountains surrounding us, which is why we called it the Goldfish Bowl. Um but it never felt like to me when I was younger that I was trapped. It felt like you almost protected. It was it was beautiful. There was a pub on every corner. Everybody had a story to tell. There was a lot of sense of humour. There was loads of playing fields. You play football, and we'd spend all of our time just hanging out up the mountains, you know, setting up fires or building dens out of ferns and stuff. So it was a, it was a cool childhood in that respect. So the the colliery had closed, had it? Had so the mines had closed time. by the time I was a kid. But all the houses we all lived in were originally built to house the miners. So, but my upbringing was all factory work. My dad was working in the factory. My oldest brother, Kevin, he was 17 going to uh, the army. So he was in Northern Ireland by the time he was 18 in the mid 80s. Um, and my other brother, Lee, was doing like a carpentry apprenticeship. So I'd be sharing a bedroom with my brother, Lee, till he was about, till I was 14. So we were in a tiny little bedroom and I'd be listening to all his Bob Seger records and Eagles records and ZZ Top and all that stuff. And Kevin be playing Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young and Neil Young and Dylan in the other room. And my old mum be playing Stevie Wonder, Talking Book, and that downstairs. So I would be listening to all the soul, the folk, and all the rock stuff all at the same time. So you'd get the rock and roll, the country stuff, and all the storytelling stuff, and all the voices coming from three different rooms, really. That's so I, I kind of put all that together and formed brilliant. this band. That's, that's just brilliant. <laughs> and of course, and wasn't it the, your your dad's record was on the jukebox, wasn't it? His one. Yeah, my old man had a he had a small record deal with Polydor um, just before I was born, and. He, he, he recorded a record in, in Air London when he was in Oxford Street. And uh, his single was written by Graham Nash, um, a track called Simple Man. And like George Martin and Ron Richards and people like that were on the production team. And, um, uh, wow, and Dud- wow. Dud- Dud- Dudley Moore was the piano player. <laughs> oh, <God>. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was quite a session, actually. It's a great. <laughs> I've, and I I've found it on a Memorex cassette, so I digitized it here. Um, just to have a version of it, you know, it's all mono and stuff. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a ropey recording, but you can, you can, the orchestration is, is amazing on it. Yeah. But I've, I've, have you, have you come across Graham Nash ever? To... I've never met Graham Nash. Oh, I've worked with, that's, a, that's annoying. I wish I could, I wonder if no, he's I'm, aware of it. No, I, I don't know if he's aware of it. Yeah. yeah. But, um, it's weird because now we, we have all these kids from Scandinavia and Belgium sending me the seven inch of my dad's record because we couldn't find him much in this country. <laughs> all these Polydor records keep getting sent to my management company. So I've got a few of them. So when I was a kid, we couldn't find them. When, when I, I, was, I, wow. I tried to hunt one down just to hear what your dad sounded like, you know, and, and yeah. he, he, he goes, he went under the name of Arwin Davidson, didn't Arwin he? Davidson, yeah. He, he, but he's yeah. Arwin Jones, obviously, but. Well, his name was when he was singing in the clubs. They were called Oscar and the Kingfishers, and his name was Oscar Jones. Oscar was his nickname. His real name was Arwen. But at the time, you had Jack Jones, you had Tom Jones, and they said the fucking Jones has got to go. <laughs> <laughs> but I felt but all, 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 all my upbringing, we were under the phone book as in, under Davidson for some reason. I don't know. I don't know what the fuck that was all about. I found uh, a track because well, the rest of the phone book is literally just Jones. You're probably the exactly, only number yeah. people could only, find. Only one Davidson in there. Yeah. I found. Uh, one called Birth, Life and Death. Yeah, that's the B-side, yeah. Right, which was written by um, uh, Roger Cook and Roger Greenaway. I, I know I know yeah. both of those guys. I know Roger Greenaway quite well, you know, and they did yeah. all the Blue Mink stuff. 
as well. That's right. And, the, and Roger Cook was the one who did all the arrangements on it. He always used a lot of French horns and stuff like that. So, But when, was... I, when I listened to it, it kind of all made sense to me because the person your old man sound, sounded like the most was Rod Stewart. It was kind of what right. he was doing, right? And, and, and your sort of direct connection with that period British rock and roll is is sort of obvious to me. You know, I, I, I can hear I can hear some small faces in what you do. I can hear certainly, you know, Rod is there and you know and yeah. and, and Ronnie Lane. And lyrically, you know, I mm. the, the the tracks a track that really I think of when I listen to your lyrics, especially your early stuff, is Debris, you know, Ronnie Lane's yeah. Debris on oh, the Faces yeah, yeah. album. So that yeah. did you ever feel? Then of course, you did handbags and glamour. Yeah, but do you feel that you yeah. were sort of holding a flame for your dad, who wasn't as successful? Well, my old man was like my old man listened to he he would sing a lot of like Sam Cooke stuff and things like that. He had a much cleaner voice. I mean, Birth, Life, and Death is a bit more of a soul kind of gospely vibe. Um, I, I think when I was a kid, I didn't really have a lot of. Um, we didn't have any faces of Rod Stewart stuff playing in the house a great deal. It's, it's quite weird because I found that. Rod's, I found the faces when I was making like our third album. We'd always put a nods of goods of wink on on a Friday night. It's and, the greatest uh, album ever made. One of the greatest. Yeah, it's a great party record. And then when we were mixing that album in New York, we were mixing with Andy Andy um, Wallace. Uh, we found this faces box set and found that track handbags and glad rags. And then I did it on a solo tour and then did it on the Jules Holland show and it became this big hit. And then we recorded it again and blah, blah, blah. But Debris, weirdly, I, I got to know Ronnie Wood quite well around about 2000. And... Um, and he asked me to come and do a gig with him. He was playing in a theatre in town and he had, um, he had the whole of Stomp play the second half. So we had all these people banging on buckets and stuff like that in the second <laughs> half. And the first half we did these songs and I, and I did um, I did Debris with him. Did you? So, uh, yeah, somebody else uh, sang the other bit and I did the Rod Stewart bit and, um, and he recorded it on this little album of his. But, but lyrically, I mean, it was always the small town stories that got me hooked at the beginning. It was uh, storytelling by... You know whether it was early Dylan or Neil Young stuff, and I, and I love the band from Canada called the Tragically Hip, who would tell lots of small town oh, stories yeah. as well. So uh, it was it was coming from all sorts of different people, really. Yeah, because it was more life in a tramp vest, you know, and uh, yeah. that was you and working yeah. in the greengrocers, wasn't it? Some story. Yeah, I used to work in the market, yeah, selling fruit and veg on the weekends. So I left school at sixteen, went to do uh, screenwriting in the. Uh, yeah, that's very sophisticated, isn't it? Going to art college and doing screenwriting, isn't it? Yeah, I did five years of art college, and then when I left, I, le I left my final year. You know, you have the cap and gown and all that, and then I went. I thought, well, what am I going to do now? I, I think I was just killing time because I knew the band was still going every Thursday and Sunday. We were rehearsing and stuff, and then um, I did a, a course for the unemployed in a place called Chapter Art Center, just writing screenplays, being taught how to write screenplays. And at the end of the course, uh, the guy Philip John. Well, I think director Downton Abbey and stuff now. Uh, he asked me to pitch the idea I had to a real life uh, film producer, the head of the BBC. So I pitched it to him and he actually gave me the job and um, he gave me money to go and buy a computer and actually write this idea to develop as a, as a BBC drama. And then literally two weeks or three weeks went by and Richard Branson offered us a fucking record deal. So I was in this crossroads of writing screenplays or, you know, taking the rock and roll thing on and, Obviously, I took the band thing on and carried on writing the screenplays and stuff like that um, and wrote the videos and tried to direct a few videos and all the rest of it. And So, I mean, this all kind of comes under the bracket of storytelling, ultimately, you know. I often wonder this with people who write like you, because as you said, a lot of your stuff, you overhear snatches of stuff at a bus stop. And mm. everything. So, so, it's, so you're building on these lovely sort of snapshots of ordinary life and everything. Yeah. But as one's life changes yeah. and you're not standing at the bus stop anymore, yeah, but the conversations that you're overhearing, which is, oh, yeah, something I heard at reception at the spa at the Four Seasons Hotel, <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily so relatable anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, life changes. Um, yeah. I think when you st when I started off, it was all very observational, looking out, uh, mm -hmm. especially the album one and two, and then midway through album three, I think you started it. You know, you that typical thing: you first time travel around the world, you write about you know the big bad world and mainly your experiences with America the first time, which most bands end up doing. It's everyone's second album. Yeah, and then when you get to like your fourth album, you know, you've probably gone through your, your first, uh, you've given your first house where your first relationship has fallen well, apart. Well, you made, a, you made a massive album with, with that as your as the entire story, virtually, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. 
So, I, yeah, it, I, you know, I started to just write what was happening to me, really, you know, truthfully and trying to be as honest as I can with everything I've written. And whether that was observational or, or personally, I tried to write it as truthfully as I can. And, and sometimes they really connect with people and yeah, other I, times they get missed, you know. I think what you, what, you, what you haven't done is that kind of Drake, sort of Robbie Williams sort of... Um that kind of thing where you sort of how 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 difficult it is being a star you know how, you know oh, no. trapped in my isolated world how heavy is the crown you know and all that sort of yeah stuff. yeah you know. no i mean i i understand people go through all that stuff and i'm sure everybody now in a position who's been in a band that's had success feels like that at times but i've got four kids in the house they can't give a shit what band i'm in you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh and i go down you know i'm Tesco's Metro to buy my stuff and I go to the shop to do what I want to do. You know, I've, I've never really, I've never really felt that kind of pressure. I felt I don't really buy into all the, I never got into it to be famous. Stuart who's passed away now. He, I mean, he got in a band to become famous and to have a fast car and to have a big house and have a pool and all that. But I kind of fell into it in the sense of, I didn't really know what I was doing and I didn't, I didn't really know where the words were coming from. I didn't really know what it was all about. I was probably following my old man's footsteps a little bit when I was younger. And then it just took over because my man never wrote songs, you know. So once I found that voice, I think it was a cathartic thing looking back on it a bit. Um, but I was never in it for the fame and all the glory and all that stuff. I mean, I've enjoyed moments of it along the way and had a good crack, the same as everybody else. But no, it's not. I don't, I don't see it in in those kind of uh, how heavy is the crown in, in the fame or poor me kind of yeah, situations. Yeah, yeah. But that's nice because, I mean, to be honest, this, the stereophonic story, your story, is the absolute template of kind of the dream and well-deserved kind of rock and roll thing boys from the village and the valleys get together as the kids and then work you worked really hard right you yeah. were just in the van grafting and then then it's the then the hits come down yeah. so it is the, it's, it's exactly the story that's meant to be if you know what i mean it's the one that yeah i mean it was you know we worked for 10 years before we had a record deal when we had the record deal we had 36 a and r people coming over the bridge to see us and then we had to pick one and we picked the one that set up all these regional teams. We didn't want to play London. The idea was to build up a true fan base in every city, in every yeah. county. So by the mm -hmm. time we had the front covers and all the rest of it, it was real. It wasn't just going to fall away again. Um, and it, it paid off, you know. And then all the people we loved, Jimmy Page, The Who, Led Zeppelin, uh, Oasis, Rolling Stones, David Bowie, Chili Peppers. I mean, every U2, everybody took us on tour. So we were like, well, this is fucking mad, isn't it? So we were on the side of the stage watching all of our idols and they were telling us how much they loved our latest records. Yeah, so yeah. it was like fucking, you know, we were playing the Ivy Bush literally, you know, three years before. And there's, there's, some, there's some good stories there as well, which we, we could talk about. I just wanted to mention quickly yeah. before we sort of move out of Wales, as it were, is is what's known as the sort of Cardiff music scene. Because mm. in, in my little research here, I found out that, that, that the oldest record shop in the world is in Cardiff. Yeah, the Spillers, the right? Spillers, yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a big, they had a big um, uh, dispute because it was almost going to get closed down. I think recently, um, but that's where I used to go shopping for records. You know, we you go to HMV and stuff, but in Spillers, you'd have like photocopies of the covers, and you'd have to go through them to try and find the one you wanted. And I remember, I wasn't very. Uh, Stuart was always about four or five years older than me, uh, and I wasn't allowed to go to Cardiff unless I went to Cardiff with Stuart. And I remember finding his latest Rush album in this shop and I actually finding it from a feeling like this. I've, you know, I've rewarded my journey to Cardiff by finding you the latest Rush album because he was a massive Rush fan because he's a fucking drummer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Spillers was cool. It's tiny, though. It's a tiny little shop. 1894. Is it, Is it still there? Yeah. 1894 guy, it started. Wow. I don't know what kind of records that. Probably something you played on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Uh, and Sam's Bars around the corner, which was one of the oldest gigs as well. We used to play it in there a lot. Because there's such a wow. rock scene that comes out of, of South Wales, isn't there, really, out of Wales? Is... Yeah, from the 70s. I mean, there's lots of stuff we used to listen to. Yeah, it, it, was, so... a good, it was a great scene when we were kids. I mean, it was, it was bands playing in every pub, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, when we, it was a lot of tribute bands when we were starting out. We almost considered becoming a, a Jimi Hendrix tribute band for a bit, but I'm glad I didn't do that. <laughs> and with, with... But I heard last night, I spoke to someone who's a neighbour who used to be an A&R mm -hmm. man, and he said he remembers, I'm talking about, and uh, think going up to see you in Wales when you were still a covers band, that you already had a rep then, and people were thinking of signing you when you were just a covers band. 
Yeah, we were playing so. in places like the filling station in Newport, and uh, yeah, a lot of people would come and see. Yeah, the band was the band was a popular band. We, you know, we would sell pubs out of beer. You know, every time we played there, anyway, you know, that was the mark of the mask need to come back. There was nothing left to sell. So, <laughs> but it's how you get your chops together being a covers band. Absolutely, uh, yeah. the feeling. Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's your Hamburg, isn't the it? The feeling were a covers band. Yeah. Well, the Beatles yeah. started off the, the same way, obviously. But it is how you yeah. how you the develop. Feeling, yeah. Another band. But that's tricky, isn't it? With a bass player called when Richard when Jack. all that Brit pop, was, yeah. when all the Brit pop <laughs> thing was was sort of was happening in the nineties though. Yeah. You, how did you feel about this voice that you developed, this very American voice being so different? You know, it's it, yeah. Was it something that, that you were just you were just happy in yourself finding? Yeah, that's interesting because you know I was listening to John Fogerty from Creedence Clearwater Revival and oh. and you know uh, people like that and, and Otis Redding and you know people that was Paul Rogers was one of my favorite singers as well oh, from yeah, Freeze. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah, it's yeah. like. Um, so when the Britpop thing happened, you know, 94, 95, 96, at the same time, uh, the Black Crows were coming out of America and all that stuff as well. And obviously the, the grunge scene was kind of happening. So I was listening to that stuff as much as I was listening to the Brit stuff. And right. I liked the Oasis records um, just because I, I think Liam had a, had a kind of great rasp to his voice as well. So we would cover stuff like that in the pubs, but... And Supergrass, I thought, were a great pop band, and, and I thought Pulp were writing great lyrics and stuff. Um, so it was it was interesting because we came up behind all that. We were signed by '96. Our first album was out in '97, um, but we knew we didn't quite fit into it, and I knew we couldn't be categorised in the same things here because we didn't sound like any of them. Um, but what we, what we took from it is we saw how fast all those Brit pop bands fell away if they didn't deliver the goods, really. Because mm -hmm. once the scene went away, most of the bands went away, apart from a, like a handful. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we just had one eye on how the game was being played at that point, but we knew we weren't part of that scene because it, it started before we kind of got our leg on the ladder. But, but you know, what was amazing about it was how amazing the music scene was and the country's culture was at that point in time. You know, it was like being in the 1970s again. It was bands everywhere. Yeah, it was and, rock and roll. Yeah. But there's also a tiny little sort of uh, muso point is that apart from, say, Angus or something, you hadn't seen an SG for 15 years. No. You hadn't seen anyone playing an SG. At all, and suddenly everyone had an SG. <laughs> yeah, I know Gibson offered me a deal for that to actually do the old model, but I never. Oh, right. But yeah, but the sales went up after. Yeah, they, they did tell me I had an Epiphone one at first. Stuart Stuart Cable was was really close with you in the forming of the band, and was someone that was part of the group in as much as you were. And things didn't go well for Stuart as as yeah. as your career went along did was there a sense that he that you were always having to look after him or be careful with him well when we first Stuart was my first fan of my words really um if i wrote some lyrics and he would look at them and i if, you know because as i said because i was younger Stuart's house was the one i used to have to watch the young ones you know uh, and, and and you know first time i saw the damned or something on, on the young ones and then you know, Evil Dead 2 and then run down the street shitting myself to get back into the house, which was seven doors away, you know. And so it was like a, it was like another big brother in a way, you know, because I was always brought up with older brothers around me and all my brother's mates playing three-car brag in the house and I was having to sit there watching Halloween at the age of eight or something uh, while well, they were all, you know, gambling pennies on the floor. So Stuart and me had a very close relationship because he, he kind of put me under his wing because I think he saw talent in me at a very young age. And he would be very, very protective of me. Yet we would butt heads a lot because we had very, very similar personalities to a degree and very, very different on other angles. Quite complex, really. But it got to like about, I don't know, after the second album, I could see he was kind of, I think he was done in a sense. He was done in the sense that we've achieved what we set out to do. I've got the nice house, I've got the nice car, traveling's becoming a bit of a schlep. He was the first one to have a kid. Um, and then his marriage started to go a little bit out of, uh, you know, that was going downhill. And then he started to get out a bit out of control with all the other stuff that was going on in his lifestyle. So by that point, I didn't know what he was doing because he was hanging out in Cardiff. He was hanging out with a different scene. He wasn't hanging out with us so much. And then he was just drifting. He wasn't at the studio as much as he should have been. And... As much as we tried to piece it back together numerous times, it wasn't really, really working. Me and Richard were constantly trying to go forward with it. We were getting more and more opportunities and 
And Stuart was just always trying to throw a span in the works, looking at the schedule. He didn't want to do much or go anywhere. So it was becoming a bit, bit strained, really. Um, and then when he when we asked him to leave the band at that point, he left. He he completely understood it. He, you know, none of us liked it. It was horrible. It was like cutting off your arm. You know. Um, but was he sort of making it so you would have to do that rather than him leave? Was it? Was it... Well, we'd given him two chances by the time that happened. You know, right. even making just enough education to form the mixing session in New York was our first reconcile week. You know, we'd already sacked him. And then when we were out there, it was like, let's rehearse out there and pull the band back together. And we did. And then when we did You Gotta Go, Let's Come Back, we went to his garage at his house just to make a vibe of it all again. And then we'd record that album, the best album experience recording I've ever had. But then when we come to the tour in, he was, I'm not going to come to Australia. Can you do that part without me? Can you do this part without me? And and bit by bit, me and Richard looked at each other. We were sitting on two stools in a festival in 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 Toronto, and the sun, it's like thirty thousand people out there. We haven't got a fucking band on stage with us, and it's just like this is not right. It's not working. So we had to let it go. And um, the best part about all of it is, obviously, you know, a year and a half after you break up, we made friends and all that. And we were talking and we would text each other and we would, you know, we'd see each other for a pint of this, that, and the other for six, seven years before he died. So thank God, because I wouldn't let. And even the day before he died. We were playing uh, Cardiff Football Stadium on the Saturday, and he was talking to me on the Friday night, saying that uh, he'll see me on Monday because it was my uncle Reese's funeral. Uncle Reese was a like a war veteran from World War Two. He was a fucking character, but everybody was going to go to this funeral because we all knew he was going to be a crack. And Stuart loved the funeral, so we said, "I'll meet you at the fu- at, at the club on Monday." So we were going to have a piss up at the club, and then on my way to the funeral. Um, I had to go past his house and all the ambulances were outside and all that, and he, he died that morning. So it was, so the whole funeral was just covered with press then, trying to find the story on what what happened last night and all the rest of it. So it's pretty tragic, but he's like, uh, yeah. he was a character. I don't think he would have, I don't think he would have lasted. I don't think he ever wanted to last longer than forty. Or to be honest, he said that when he was a kid. You know, he was just, he was just one of those guys. You know what I mean? He was he was larger than life, and yeah. he burned very very bright. And then, um, did Javier come next? Did... Well, Steve Gorman filled in no, for Steve a little while from the Crows. Cause Steve and Steve right. knew each other. Because uh, Javier was a very sweet story, wasn't it? Yeah, Javier came. It was actually because uh, Phil Manzanera taught. I think he used yeah, to work yeah, yeah. for Phil Manzanera. Yeah, and yeah, Phil, yeah. Could, Phil's, Phil runs this sort of underground network for South Americans. Cause sort of all well, Phil San Char- in Phil, London. Yeah, Phil San Charlie was our um, flying the wall documentary oh, guy yeah. yeah oh there you go um and uh, but yeah but he just told me this lovely story that that javier had just been sort of doing all the programming and everything on your dem on your yeah. sort of the tracks for the album and then you went join the band well javier was making well, not, i'm making, sure it was making, more to it than that yeah he was but. making tea in the studio um and we'd been on tour with steve gorman across america and i knew he was wrong because you know steve was part of the, of the black crows and, and it wasn't going to work uh in a long term and we'd been touring with the Strokes a little bit in Japan and we were into what they were doing. And I came and I and the Bowie tour was in, in amongst that run as well. So we were touring with Bowie across America. I know, I'm furiously jealous came, about this, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and then I came back and I'd written Dakota and I'd written Superman. I'd written what was going to become the next record, which wasn't anything at all sounding like you've got to go, let's come back with three gospel singers, rugs, joysticks, you know, long air. We, you know, one minute we look like oh, the rugs of the rugs of black crows. Yeah. yeah, yeah so we, like, yeah. So we rolled the rugs up on a ferry coming back from the Isle of Wight festival after headline. And we burnt them and chucked them over the edge, literally. And that was, <laughs> that was the end of that period. Who really. was inside them? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so when I was cutting the demo for Dakota, Javier was the one making tea and I asked him, could he put, um, just a real drum kit on it, and he fitted really well, and then he ended up getting the job with us. So, when, when you going back a little bit, when you did just just enough education and in the songwriting process, yeah, when you come up with something like "Have a Nice Day," do you know? I mean, obviously, you know, I've been in these situations before. In my yeah, life. yeah. Did you sure, know yeah. that this was the song that was going to change things for you? Sitting in a room, I mean, do you remember the process of making that record? Making that song. I remember, I remember how the song came about. The song came about when I went to, I was in San Francisco, I went down to the bay, we went to Alcatraz to look at the prison and all that, came back. This guy picked me up in a cab and he was a bit like, a bit like a John Malkovich character in Line, the, in Line of Fire, you know, a very deep, dark kind of soul. And he was like, I don't know why people come down here, man. It's all full of corporate communism, you know. It's everybody's playing four beats on the radio. Everybody's chewing, chewing gum. Everybody's eating processed fish. And he was doing all this stuff. And he told me all this stuff. And at the end, he went like that. He said, "Anyway, that'll be seven bucks. Have a nice day." And I got up the car. <laughs> Fuck it. <up."> uh-huh. <laughs> 
I just went in my room and wrote down most of the things he was talking about and um, pieced it together. I had this little riff for a while and then I pieced it together with that and I thought, well, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty catchy. That, but the story is pretty dark compared to what people think it is. You know? I'm not sure yeah. at the time, and I'm not sure that I did at the time, get the irony mm. that, mm. that was that's deep within the song title, obviously, and in, yeah. and in the tune, the sort of happy sort of of the happiness of the it's tune. It's a bit like the Born in the USA thing. You, you think it's saying yeah, one yeah. thing, but it's actually well, saying yeah. another thing, you know? Well, I thought there, obviously there must have been something. It can't be, surely he hasn't just gone to America and everyone says, have a nice day. And... Yeah, there's a bit... <laughs> But there's only been a couple I've knew, known at the time. Dakota was one I knew. I text my record company guy uh, that day and said, I think I've got one here. But most of the time it's... Yeah. You think it's the one, but it's not the one, isn't it? I'm yeah, sure because, because your songs don't rely so much on, like, any expansive arrangement usually. You know, there's very much, you know, you know when it's just you with a guitar that it's going to work or not. The song is there. It's fully yeah. born. Uh, what comes first f for you, Kelly, though? Is it d d lyrics... Uh, Do you I would write say, them out first? 80% 80, 80 of the time, I would say, it's a guitar and a melody. And maybe a phrase comes out, like Dakota, you know, that phrase, um, you made me feel like the one came out as I was singing Scrambled Eggs, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe Tomorrow was another one, which was pretty much like that. You know, you've got the melody and then the, the phrase, maybe Tomorrow. And then you then you kind of go backwards with it and finish in the other things. And if they come pretty fast, then normally they're the ones. If you have to make them as a bit of homework, it takes forever. Then it kind of you, you're stretching it a bit, but if they come quite quick, Dakota was just one, literally three verses on a page, and there's no scribbles out. And I've still got the, the book, and there's nothing, nothing altered, just from beginning to end. It's just bizarre. Well, it's interesting that thing in Get Back, isn't it, where Lennon was saying about his instruction to everyone was that you have to finish a song when when you've started writing. Yeah, yeah, I saw. I've tried that. It's not yeah. always easy to do. But <laughs> I've tried it. Some I, of them, some of them. Yeah, it's right. You're John Lennon. I, you yeah. know, I agree with him that I think that. Um, the ones that finish themselves rapidly tend to be the best songs that you write. You know, yeah. I, I don't know. That's that's been my yeah, experience. Yeah, it's my case too. I mean, you can spend a lot of time over some stuff in the studio and and on the arrangement and yeah. work on it. But the, but the, but the writing part, I think, generally, the more organic and fast it comes, I, I think usually it's the it's coming from the right place. I saw you did. You mentioned Ronnie Wood earlier because you did some. You did actually went on played on sung on his solo album as well didn't you i love ronnie by the way yeah. i saw him just before christmas we had uh, yeah, some lunch great. and he is just this kid in a sweet shop still at he's his age and he just you rest he restores your faith doesn't he in, in yeah he's business. got he's got more energy than anybody ever know i mean i knew ronnie when he was when he was drinking and all that sort of stuff up the house i'd go up there and then i've seen him go through all that kind of transition with sally now and the kids and stuff and and his painting and you know eight you know, espresso a day. <laughs> but did Come you, on, sound another coffee. But you wrote with yeah, him. How many more? You did some uh, but I, I did that track with him. Um, yeah, he, he called me up and asked me to go up there and sing. I think Steve Bush was was engineering. Steve Bush was the engineer in our first two, three records. All right. Yeah, so Steve was working with him up there. I can't remember why Steve was up there or who he was with. Um, but I sang on a track called um, What Do You Think? Beautiful song. I remember him showing me it in his little notebook and then he, he did a demo of it and I sang like a double track on it. Um, but yeah, it was a privilege. You know, he, I, I love Ronnie. He, he's he's just you know full of life. Isn't he? Did you see he did a thing on the, that someone said I don't know if it's still running. Someone set up a thing where you could hire musicians over on and you do the whole thing online. And Ronnie just put up this riff and a couple of words, and then Stuart Copeland played drums on it. And then I think I waiting for other people. And really? it, was thing, it was like it was like working in a filling station. <laughs> you need the money. Working in a filling station. Fill her up, honey. <laughs> and that was it. It was just it was just Woody doing that over and over again. Well, he's done that to me a few times. He'd phone up, he said, I've got these lyrics come up to the house. And then he's sitting in his kitchen and he's playing this song and he goes, Let's go down to the studio. He said, I, I think we're gonna get Mick Taylor to come down. And this is before Mick came back into the door. And then the next thing I was sitting there with Mick Taylor and Ronnie Wood, I go, What the fuck's going on here? But, oh my god. Yeah, yeah. And there was a boy working in the greengrocers once. Bizarre, man. It's bizarre. You came to my wedding in Finn, Ronnie, and we played in my wedding as well. Our wedding band was us lot, Paul Weller, Ronnie Wood, and Rob Brydon. Oh. <laughs> we, won't get into, we won't get into wedding and birthday bands because I think Guy might beat oh. us all. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure, yeah. I, I'd play, yeah. You had Gilmore playing at your 50th, didn't you, Guy? Well, you played at my oh, 50th. Of course I did, Gary. but I didn't want to say, you know. Yeah. Uh, Gary did an amazing thing. I've got to point that because we did... Um, 
uh, that it was fancy dress and it was it was a brilliant idea. It was just modern. Modi's rocker. not fancy is dress any... though, is it? But it was come as a. That's true. But everyone's one or the other. And Gary turned up wearing a colour scheme I've never seen him wear. He was wearing all sort of tans and browns. I was thinking, well, that's very mod, but it's that's not you, Gary. It's a very odd scene that. And then he gets out his guitar, which is a new tobacco sunburst. Les <laughs> all right. He's dressed, dressed to fit the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, getting back onto your career, I mean, listen, we're going to have to do Bowie. Jesus Christ, you supported David yeah. Bowie. I mean, he's he's one of the greatest guys that ever lived, obviously, musically and, and as an artist, but he's such a nice man too, right? Yeah. Uh, well, we yeah we did uh, the reality tour, which, which was his last tour. Mm -hmm. and, um, well, you, you weren't there when he had the heart attack in Hamburg, were you? No, we did the American oh. run. So we were doing all the amphitheaters in America. <clears throat> and then we were going to meet him again in Isle of Wight because we were headlining the Friday and he was headlining the Sunday on the same year. Um, so we were doing like um, East to West and, and the bit in the middle, you know, the bit in the middle, it was interesting because he was doing all the Let's Dance stuff. And then when he got to the East Coast, and then he was pulling out all the Trent Reznor stuff, you know, I'm afraid of American yeah, stuff. Yeah. You could see him change his set to the core of the audience. Because oh. when we first started going on, Tony, our keyboard player, was the biggest Bowie fan in the world. He was a bit like, oh, I thought he'd be playing this and thought he'd be playing that because he was he was going quite soft with it all. And he was a bit like, oh, I'm fucking gutted. I thought it was going to be so much more this and so much more that. And then as he was going along, he was just manipulating the whole, you know, the whole audience, really. So that was interesting to learn as a, as a band, using his catalogue to fit in where he was at. But as a person, you would just be wandering around the arenas and he'd come in and sit on an icebox and in a dressing room and start chatting to us because at that point... He wasn't a character, you know, he wasn't playing anybody. He wasn't mm -hmm. playing the thin white duke or anything. He was just being David Bowie. So he was very approachable. He would, I would watch him doing the sound checks all the time and he would literally talk off the stage on the mic. What was that one like, Carl? Do you think that sounds good for tonight? And he'd be like, yeah, I think so. <laughs> you know, because <clears throat> um, I kept asking him for life on Mars and um, he didn't play. And on the very last night of the tour, he, he shouted it out for us and he said, this is for Carly and the boys, this is life on Mars. Oh. And we were like, fucking hell. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. It was pretty amazing, actually. Did, did you do short short numbers in your when you did your sound checks? Oh, yeah, this, yeah, that was the thing I was telling on that solo tour. We were in the sound checks, you know, he would sit and watch our sound checks as well. And there's footage of him um, in that film where he's just sitting there with a little baseball cap on the side of the stage and this shows him out in the amphitheater watching us. And but out of respect, we would really make the songs really short. You know, we would do like trying out all of our different guitars. We'd do a minute of one song and then 30 seconds of another song and a minute of another song and then try a bit of this and a bit of that and then walk off. And then and then he put his arm around me one day and he goes, you know, if you extended a few of those songs, you said you might be fucking onto something. <laughs> <laughs> and did you do that? Yeah, we tried it. We, well, once we knew we had a bit longer, we took our time. Yeah. <laughs> he's the first guy I ever saw ever, you know, when people use samples and... And tracks on stage and are now in a, in a very traditional way. On that tour, he would go on in the soundcheck with his band and he would record the stuff they couldn't produce as a five piece in the soundcheck through the desk. So they would record the tracks live and then reproduce the tracks with the band in the evening that night. Wow. So he was actually basically cutting stuff in the soundcheck to play alongside the stuff they were playing live that oh. night. Guy, you played with David, did you once? Well, his second last uh, ever live performance was with us at the Albert Hall with David Gilmore when he got up and sang Arnold Lane and Comfortably Numb, which was just really? absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. But it's funny you say that because one of the first, uh, the first big band I was in was this Australian band called Ice House and we opened up for him at Milton Keynes. And I feel, you know, we played Milton Keynes Bowl on the Sirius Moonlight tour. And it's to my eternal shame, we had this thing that we didn't really get a sound check. And so we went up before, and so for our sound check, we played Let's Dance. <laughs> oh, so everyone had heard it when he went on. Which is, oh, I can feel the shame now. <laughs> I know, I feel terrible. I'm sure I, why I've announced it on a podcast, I do not know. Well, it's there now. Yeah. <laughs> Ke uh, Got it. Kelly, one of the sort of pivotal albums of, that I, I think for you was uh, you've got to go there to come back. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Because... You suddenly decide to take over the production as well. Not only does this album sound really different to anything you've done before, more mature, if you like, but you decide to say, right, boys, I don't need anyone else in the room. I mean, how does that relationship work with the rest of them, the, with the other guys, with with Richard and uh, I, I don't know, was, was was Stuart still around then? No? Stuart, yeah, Stuart was on there, yeah. Uh, um, well, I asked um, when we were making Just Enough Education Reform, my, my musical relationship with Bird and Bush was... was uh, I, I guess the musicality side, I would always, me and Marshall Bird would sit together because he was the piano player. 
I mean, he would have a crack. And Steve Bush was much more technical, and he was the one giving the drummer a hard time about keeping in time. So, and the, and, and me singing sometimes, wherever he was, he was much more precise about stuff. So I asked Marshall at the end of that record, I said, look, I think I want to do the next one um, without that kind of rigidness, really. I want to try to do something a bit different. Do you want to do it with me? And he wouldn't leave uh, Steve Bush. So by the time we came to make You Gotta Go, Let's Come Back, in my mind, I wanted to make my version of Stevie Wonder's Talking Book or a Credence record. I wanted things to be... I wanted to make an overdub every four or eight bars. I wanted something new to come in. I wanted it to be different. I wanted it to sound very free. Uh, I already had my, in my mind, I wanted Jack Joseph Puig to mix it because he made he mixed that Jellyfish record, which I always thought was a, oh. a very great kind of modern take on a Beatles Abbey Road vibe. You know, it was lots of stuff coming in, not all kind of just mixing by numbers. But the band were really supportive at that point. Um, it was the best recording session we ever had. It was before any of us had kids. We were all down in the studio. All the crew were with us. Uh, everybody stayed there in Hook End Manor and Henley. We stayed there for about three months. We blacked out the windows and we just had a, an amazing time, really. And um, I, to me, it's a very soulful, very real, honest record. And it's, yeah. it's my favourite album that, that we've made, really, personally, you know. And so now you've got with the, what's with the axis of the band? Because it's you and Richard now who are only, you know, you. Yeah. Is that like a, I mean, does everyone else have to kind of come in? on that relationship or do you know what I mean? I mean, that's... well, Tony, Tony plays the keyboards live with us. He's been with us since the second album. So he's from Manchester, Tony. And he's, he's always been there with us. Adam who plays the guitar with us live and on, and on the last bunch of records. I mean, he was touring in a band that used to open up for us in 96, 97. So they've been mates with us for forever as well. And Jamie's been in the band now almost 10 years. So, Everybody in the band is, what's amazing about this band is we actually do go out for a pint together. You know, we do hang out together. Um, and a curry, is it still a pint and a curry? We love a curry. We go on, a, you know, we're all on the same bus. We have, we take the piss out of each other constantly. And it's like, I think people understand that my role has always been where it is. I, you know, I, I write the songs and, you know, Adam will jump in and chuck an idea here and there. And if it works, it works, you know. Um, me and Richard were in school together from three years old. So me and him have never really had a crossword. You know, we've just we just grown up together. You know, Richard knows what I do and I know what he does and we support each other in different ways. Just being in a band, as you all know, it's not always about the music. It's about each other's character and how yeah, they support yeah. one another off the stage as much as on it. It really you know? is. You know, I think, you know, one of the things that I uh, miss not being any, you know, not hanging out with Spandau Ballet at all anymore is, mm. is was... You know, we actually did have, have such a great laugh. And when we got back together after years and years of being apart, the first mm. thing was uh, all of us pissing ourselves in the rehearsal. Yeah, I know. Um, it's it's mad how you know we we went to the studio after the all the lockdown stuff, and we came back, and we'd been laughing so much. Obviously, people thought we'd been on holiday because we looked so like you know relaxed and everything but that that's mm. part of the crack you know being in the studio with your mates and yeah i couldn't i can't imagine being in a band where it's it's just stress every day where you just can't stand being in each other's company and all that, that, you know? that that's a, that but that's a, there's like there's two models isn't there there's the there's the band where it is it's just this family and you're you know it's you against the world musketeers and then there's the the band that absolutely hate each other yeah. and that friction produces great art absolutely yeah so, it can yeah. do yeah 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 i feel yeah. i feel like in my old band we had kind of had both going at the same time really you know yeah. well we did we did for about two albums but then it all fell into play <laughs> and sometimes the humor is is masking the the the, the cracks underneath but uh you know, we used to I, slag each other off in interviews. We did all come out in the press interviews as we were doing in front of each other. I think you've you've been a bit a, a, ahead of the game at times with, with some of the music you made. I mean, there's a track I think on um, uh, on the album we were just talking about, the one with maybe tomorrow on. I mm. think it's called something. Uh, Since I told you it was over, I think it may yeah. have been. It's Michael Kiwanuka. You know, it's what you hear now coming out yeah. of Radio Six, but it wasn't what you heard then. And I know you've always had a little bit of a friction with, with, with reviewers and with the press. And I mean, you wrote a song yeah. about it, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but it, it, it's never bothered you. You never felt I've got to make an album for t that sounds like this for today. Or... No, I mean, there's been exactly songs like that. After that song, you know, people like, you know, James Morrison and all sorts of people wanted to, you know, make records with, with us. And, all, you know, it's, it's interesting. You do, um, well, I think you just be true to whatever you're listening to at that time or whatever you want to express. So I, I think it bothered me on the second record when I realised that it wasn't going to go the way that we thought it was going to go press-wise, you know. 
um, they praised you up, you know, one minute they compared me to like Dylan Thomas under milk wood and then they're having a popper us calling us fucking meat and potatoes. We just like one extreme to the other. And then we just like, well, there's no point even trying to play this game. We're just going to do what we do. The people are in front of us. We know what we want to do. We, we had a great sense of self as a band. Um, and we always, and we always did. All we ever wanted to do was make a catalog of music that stood the best of time, test of time. You know, but again, that's where that unity of being the kids who have come up together really counts, isn't it? Yeah, when you can, it's uh, important, you know. Um, by... Yeah, I mean, when we did the quarter, people didn't get that at first. You know, that didn't sound anything like us. Um, uh, and you don't know where they come from sometimes, but I think because the band has always had influences from all over the place, lots of bands, they have, you know, they, you know, they like the Stone Roses and the Beatles and that's that, you know. But with us, we would be listening to... ACDC on one hand, and we'd be listening to Aretha Franklin on the other hand. You know, um, and we never really had any boundaries. When we came out, we literally were in everything from Smashes to Krang magazine and on the front cover of all of them, you know, from Melody Maker to The Enemy to Q magazine. And we fitted in so many different genres. We were on two with The Who, Skunk and Nancy and Knicky, you know, Lauren Laverne's band in the same week. You know, it, it was just like we fitted the songwriting, just fitted in all these different places. So it was. Guy, we want to know. Well, it's that. It's it sounds like that. You know, the house you grew up in. It sounds like that's yeah. a, that's somewhere you would you would pay a fortune to be sent as a kid <laughs> to get you. Yeah, and, and 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 my mom was a decent cook and all. But but guy, we want to know if there are any Pete Townsend stories, obviously, because we love Pete. Yeah. Uh, well, we did. Uh, we did. Um, the first ever Teenage Cancer Trust, so obviously Roger... That's right, I yeah. remember that, yeah. Well, Roger yeah. always championed you, I know that. Yeah, so. Roger always took us on. Well, I was one... Yeah, the, but what about Pete? What about We did the Quad Rafina <laughs> tour. And the first thing Pete ever said to me was I walked on the stage. Well, that day was a really weird day for me because I was completely in awe of everything that was going on. I was in V2 Records, Holland Park, which was obviously Richard Branson's old house. So mm -hmm. I was standing there thinking, how the fuck am I, how am I in you? I just befriended Noel Gallagher. And Noel said, I'm going to come and pick you up and take you to the Albert Hall to do the sound check with The Who. I'm thinking, all right. So Noel Gallagher picks me up in this Merc or whatever car it was. He I'm doesn't drive, though, by the way. He's in the back seat, he, right? He can't, he no, can't no, drive. He's yeah. in the back. He's No, he can't drive. And I remember sitting in the back of this car with him. It was the thickest carpet I've ever felt under my feet. I thought, <laughs> fuck, my mother hasn't even got carpets to stick in the Those Mancunians. I know how to yeah. live. And then... Uh, they love a shag. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we got to the uh, Albert Hall and uh, he took me up to the stage. And so the first time I ever met any of them, Noel introduced me to Townsend and John Entwistle was alive as well then. And Zach was playing. And obviously Roger I'd met briefly. And Noel said, I'll go and get you a cup of tea. And he went to get me a cup of tea and he put a cup of tea down my mic stand. And I was sound checking. And then Townsend said, yeah, I saw you on the uh, Jules Holland show. It was really good, yeah. So, yeah, thanks, yeah. And then uh, we, we did substitute. And then when we cut it for the, for the, uh, the gig that night, I fucked up that line where... Um, the north side of my house faces east and these faces. Yeah, the east south. Uh, it's such a tongue twist. And I knew I was going to fuck it up. The whole day I knew I was going to fuck it up. And as I wanted to do it, I, and he looked at me, he goes, and he went up and done the line for me. <laughs> so he was a bit oh, like... I thought, I'm, I'm just very glad that I. Th it sounded like that story was going to involve the cup of tea that Noel got you sort of going over all over Pete's apple. No, the cup of tea <laughs> thing. I, I, did, I, couldn't, I didn't have the heart to tell Noel. I, I didn't drink tea. So I left the tea. I, 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 I didn't know the half that, that could have been a funny story because Pete loves smashing up amps any, in the old days. So a cup of tea wouldn't have been. Well, you did ask me to turn my amp down. Did he? Yeah, he said, did he? turn it down a bit. Turn it down a bit. That's a <laughs> Really? Compared to Pete? Who would have thought? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I think it's. Well, no, that's big. Do you know why? Because he can. Because he can tell you. Well, it was. I mean, was right he can't tell Pete, can't tell can Pete, he? Pete. Can't tell Pete. So. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I mean, the thing yeah, is about you, you uh, Kelly, and you guys is is your live show. You know, you've been this incredible live force. You know, throughout throughout the years, that really has been your kind of your your thing, hasn't it? More than anything else. Yeah. Well, we. I think we started as a live band as kids, and that's that's always been our you know, where I feel most comfortable, I think, on stage. Especially, you, know. you played Cardiff Castle as well, which is, you know, I know a little yeah. bit about Cardiff Castle, you know, that oh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, you know, just the yeah. design inside is wonderful, amazing design. And, uh, yeah, well, I think, I think William we Burgess. Like first... Joe, William Burgess, who died, let, let me just talk about this guy. Don't smirk. I can see you smirking, right? <laughs> but there is a little rock and roll connection because William Burgess, who designed the interior for Cardiff Castle in the 19th century, he designed the house that Jimmy Page lives in now. In the is that right? Yeah, Tower House. Oh, right. 
So, so, you know, and all, and all like when I look that, on that doesn't actually make Cardiff Castle rock no, and but roll. When I look, but, when, okay, but it does. But when I look on YouTube and I see all those your Welsh mates all wrecking the joint, I'm like, ah. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that, that that was a that was one of the early gigs. That was a, like I don't think anybody had played there for 20 years the first time we did that. I think Queen was the last band to play there, like 20 years or something before. But, um, now the live thing is an important thing. We 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 love the live thing. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, is it still there for you? You still is that? Yeah, I do. I do love playing the uh, doing the live gigs and the touring. That's where yeah, that's where the band. I think that's who we are. Really, we're a live band. I mean, mm-hmm. I love solving the problems in the studio and doing all the studio stuff, and I love putting the records together. And then you get that in between bit where you you know. You have to do all the TV and all the radio stuff, which is all right. The podcasts, yeah, the podcasts and stuff. But, um, <laughs> but the live thing is, I think, where we we have the most crap. Have you found because you none of us have been able to play live very much uh, that it's um, is that detrimental to your inspiration as a songwriter? The last two years have been um, quite weird physically on me. I've noticed my body being really weird without playing live. Uh, because I, I would imagine after doing it for nearly thirty years, there's a physicality to it and. Uh, and a release of stuff, and then you take it away. I have felt like my body's wondering what the fuck's going on a bit. But writing-wise, I, I haven't really put a great deal into it over the period of lockdown. I put I pieced that album together. That, you know, I think writing comes in different periods on different records. Sometimes I've written in hotel rooms and on buses and planes, and sometimes you just write it when you're home. I, I've never really had a set place for it. I've never been one of those guys who needed a cabin on top of a mountain at a certain month of the year where the moon's out and something like that. But it just come when they come, really. This battery's going to run out now. Yeah, we're going, to, we're going to leave you, oh. but just to say, when's the yeah. album? The rest of the album coming out? When? Are... Uh, we got another, we got a, we did a video yesterday. I think that song comes out week week Friday. Song called Forever, and then I think the album's out March the fourth. Um, well, and then we're on tour. Hopefully, if it happens. Yeah, for well, all of us. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, all the very best with that. Kelly, really, well, thank really you very much. Thank you. Thank you very good much. Good luck. Good luck with the album, and uh, it's been great talking to you. Oh, thanks yeah, for having us on. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, mate. All the best. Thank you. That was good, guy. It sort of touches everything that this show is about, really, doesn't it? You know? Yeah, name dropping. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. Because uh, he's such a connected boy, isn't he? I'm so jealous. I spent most of He really is. He really is. Uh, I know. I wish we need to get someone around there and kind of nick his address book. Yeah. Oh, listen. I mean, we, we don't do too badly ourselves. You, especially. No. God. No, that was really nice. Really nice. Very refreshing. And and, and very, he looks very healthy. Very healthy looking chap. And uh, Ben Jones is our producer. It's no relation, is it, Ben? Not that I'm aware of. No. Oh, there he is. There he is. Well, you'd be you're in the village. They don't call you Jones the producer. <laughs> Jones the steam. <laughs> yeah, no, excellent, bad. And, uh, and what a nice guy and a proper talented man. And um, we'll have another one on next week, I'm sure, won't we? Oh, I'm sure we will have another one on next week. You always say that. We'll have someone else on well, next week. Of course we'll have someone else. Like, talk about stating the bleed obvious. Well, I'm sort of hoping all the time, you know. We'll have the same person on next week and the week after that and the week after that until you're so bored. <laughs> you won't be here, though, will you? I hope not. <laughs> sick of you telling me who you've played bass with. Anyway, next week you can... I'm, I'm sick of you setting me up to have to tell people who I played bass with because you ought to sort of shame me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, listen, we're rambling on. Uh, we'll see you next week. And so it's good night from me. And good night from them. <laughs>